Welcome GDLers to another edition of Scripting Adventure. This is Bruce from Barking Dog Bim and today we're going to look at dynamic hotspots or stretchy hotspots. Those are those purple diamond shaped hotspots by which you can edit the length of different parameters in your object. And we will be adding one to edit the size of our corner radius of either our rounded corner or chamfered corner desktops. Exciting times! Let's get scripting. A handy toolbar to have turned on is your Edit GDL Library Parts toolbar. Make sure under your Work Environment, Model Rebuild Options, your Interrupt with Error Messages is turned on. Open the help under help, documentation, GDL reference guide. That will open the PDF version. And the online version can be found at gdl.graphisoft.com and click on reference guide. We'll open our object by selecting it and going file, libraries and objects, open object. You can also use the shortcut here while the object is selected or it's this button here on your toolbar. We'll restore down using this button up here. On a Mac, it's right click on the tab and choose undock. Let's open our 3D script, restore it down. What we'll do first is just create a 2D script for our object. And seeing as we have our 3D script all working, it's reasonably easy to achieve. So we just open our 2D scripting window. Have it side by side with our 3D window and we just copy across what we need. So you'll remember in a previous script we created our hotspots and our pen and fill declarations. So we'll just copy what we need. We'll need the desktop, place that here, desktop. We'll just copy the whole lot. and then adjust it for our 2D. So we don't need building material, we don't need desktop, we don't need the add Z. We do need these commands, but they're slightly different for 2D. They're not 15s, they're 1s. So I'll just change these. If we go to our help under 2D shapes, drawing elements and find our poly 2b statement which is what we'll be using there it is and we see that there's no explanation here as to what s1 is now the way the helps laid out is that all the sub variants of a statement won't have everything you need to know you need to go to the first instance of a particular type of statement and in this case it's poly 2 underscore and that will have everything I need to know about the poly2 underscore family, if you will, of statements. And then each subsequent subvariant of a statement will flesh out what you need to know about that slightly different version. So you would recall that with our prisms, we use 15, and that will show a side, lines, top and bottom and beginning. Well, we're in 2D. We don't have sides. It's not a 3D. So there's a slight difference in the status value. And we see here that the status value, J1 is next segment is visible. And that's what we're after. So if it's a 1, the line's visible. If it's a 0, the line is invisible. Now, the final statement we'll be using will be a poly2 statement. And we don't need any smoothing in 2D does that automatically so we don't need those 64 plus 64 status codes so we've updated all our status codes now instead of a prism command we just need a poly 2 statement let's copy that down to here Uncomment, get rid of these. We don't need that trash statement. That was just to demonstrate how to clear the buffer. 
And remembering this is NSP divided by 3. And the 7 is made up of a 1 plus 2 plus 4. That's how we've arrived at that 7 figure. So to clarify that, under our poly2 underscore statement for our frame fill here, we have our frame fill flags down here. J1 is draw contour. J2, which is 2, is draw fill. And J3, which is 4, is close and open polygon. So that last one means I don't have to define an additional coordinate point at the beginning of the polygon. I just have to define the last one and it will close the polygon for me. So let's have a look at our 2D script, make sure it's working. 2D view, rather. Restore that down. Square, rounded, chamfered. There we go. So you may have noticed with the rounded one here, because I've still got the project 2 command turned on, you can see the difference between the faceted 3D and the smooth 2D. So in our 2D script, we'll just comment out this project 2, like so. And there we go. Nice and smooth. So let's save that, have a look. And if I just draw a line and put it to the bottom of the display order, we can see that our masking fill is working properly. And I can now select this using a magnet select. And it looks nice and neat. So there's our 2D. And that's how easy it is to create your 2D script once you've got your 3D script working nicely. Let's just rearrange these so that I can keep track of them a bit easier. Okay, so we want to add our dynamic hotspot to flexibly change this corner radius or this corner chamfer. It's not something you'd normally do, but for demonstration purposes, that's what I'll show you here. If we look at the help under graphical editing using hotspots, we're confronted with this. And if you're anything like me, you freak out a little bit because this, what do you do with this? It's pretty complicated, right? Got all of these brackets and codes and bold and type and attributes. And then when you go to the next page, there's diagrams and more text and it just it's how do you make sense of it all i want to do is do a stretchy hotspot and this is just looks thoroughly confusing so let's break it down a little bit so for the hotspot we'll just look at the hotspot 2 statement the hotspot 3 statement is effectively the same it just has the extra z dimension coordinate so here's the full statement from the help a lot of stuff there, right? But what we've learnt previously is that square brackets means it's an optional part of the statement. So if we break this down, we've got our statement, hotspot 2. Then we've got our X and our Y coordinates. Now we've done this before. You've seen it in our scripts. Hotspot 2, X and Y, that's a pretty simple statement. The next is the unID which is unique identifier. Now every hotspot, whether you declare it or not, has a unique identifier. If you don't put one in, Archicab will assign one to the hotspot. And that is so that when you attach a dimension to the object, it knows which hotspot is dimensioning. But in this case, we are going to declare a unique identifier for our hotspot. We have to because of what we are using the hotspot for. Now this unique identifier is a unique number for this hotspot in this library part. It doesn't have to be a unique number for your entire project or for your entire library, just this object. The next is param reference. What does that mean? 
well, that is your parameter name that you want to change by this stretchy hotspot. Then we will talk about the flag and what that means. The flag is the type of hotspot it is plus its attribute. And if we have a quick look at the help, we will see that flags are made up of the hotspots type and the hotspots attribute. The type, we've got three that belong to a length type editing hotspot, and we've got four that belong to an angle type editing hotspot. And then under the attributes, we've got hide the hotspot, editable base hotspot, one for the angle, and one to use the param reference value as meters in paper space. Now we also have display param and custom description, and I'll show you what they do. But display param means that you can use the hotspot to edit one parameter, but display another while you're editing it. Custom description as well means that you can put in a description for the user, the live feedback for the user, that is your own description and not the parameter name. That'll make a bit more sense when we get into the scripting part of it. So this will be our final statement in our code, hotspot2, the x and y coordinates, a unique identifier, a parameter name, and the flag. So not quite as daunting when you break it down. For any length editing dynamic hotspot, there are three points for every one of these. They are the base hotspot, which is the fixed point from which you want to measure, the moving hotspot, which is, as you would imagine from its name, the point you move, and the reference point. It is the distance between the base point and the moving point that will be the new dimension for your parameter. The reference point works together with the base point and the moving points to let Archicad know on which vector to move the moving point. Otherwise, it doesn't know which way to move it. As such, it must lie on a straight line drawn through the moving and base points, like so. It must also lie on the opposite side of the base point than the moving point. Now, the distance between the base point and the reference point doesn't matter as long as it's absolute value. So that means once you take away the negative, any negative symbol, its absolute value is greater than zero. So if we look at the help, we see that Length type editing hotspots have three types. Type 1 is the base hotspot, type 2 is the moving hotspot, and type 3 is the reference hotspot. We also see the note that the reference hotspot is always hidden. So looking at our diagram, the base type will be type 1, the moving type will be type 2, and the reference type type 3, which will always be hidden. So as it regards our desktop, we'll look at the chamfered type as it's easier geometry to understand. The base hotspot will be here. It'll be type 1 and in line with where the corner would be. The moving hotspot will be on the chamfer corner. It'll be type 2. And the reference hotspot will be out here and type 3. Now it'll be on the opposite side of the base hotspot, as we just talked about and in a straight line. We'll want the base hotspot to be hidden. And if we look at the help, we see that this is attribute J8, which translates to 128. So let's have a look to see how this works in our code. So as we've learned, a dynamic hotspot, stretchy hotspot, will only work on a parameter. If we have a look in our master script, and our 3D script, we'll see that for our corner radius and our corner chamfer, we have used a variable called corner R. Now I can't make a dynamic hotspot work on a variable, so I need to turn that into a parameter. So there's two ways I could go about this. One is I could create my parameter and then rename it in all the scripts. And the other way, is how I'm going to do it here. Is I'll go corner R, and you'll notice here that it's corner underscore R, 
and this comes back to the GDL style guide. You'll notice that the parameters use lowercase and underscore. I've used an uppercase here because it's short for radius. But typically speaking, it's lowercase with an underscore between the words, whereas your variables are camel case. So lowercase except where there's a new word and you capitalize that letter. That's called camel case. And you do this so that you can easily identify in your script what is a parameter, what is a variable, what is a constant. It makes it easier to find where it's been used, where it's been declared. So corner R, it'll be a length parameter, and I'll call it corner radius. We want to place some limitations on that. So let's open our parameter script. Using what we learnt in a previous video, we will go values of corner R will be a range, and I want it to be greater than zero. You can't make it be zero. And I want it to be smaller than or equal to the leg offset. So in here, we will say leg offset smaller than or equal to. So remembering round brackets is greater than, square brackets is smaller than or equal to. We see that it's updated here to 10. We will make it the same as what we had it in the master script, which is 80. And in the master script, what I'll do here is I'll say corner R instead of equaling 80, I'll say corner R equals corner R. That way I don't have to go through all my scripts and change the name of what I've used. It's done now. That's all I needed to do. Let's check our 3D view. So far, yep, good, still working. Now the other thing I need to do is you remember from what we just learnt that a hotspot, when you use it as a dynamic hotspot, requires a unique ID. In order to use that unique ID, it needs to be declared first. And from a previous video, you will remember that stuff declared in the master script is available in every script. So just at the top here, we will say unID equals one. Now that unID is available for us to use in any script. So to keep this clean, we'll create another go sub to put these dynamic hotspots in. So I'll just create one here called go sub hotspots. Let's copy that to make sure we get the letters formatting exactly the same. Hotspots, remembering our colon, turns it into a label. Return, and I'll copy my separation line, and you can see it's got an exclamation mark at the front, which turns this entire line into a comment, and that's just a visual thing so that I can see how my script is split up. Hotspots, go sub hotspots. So let's just declare the one corner first and go from there. So remembering our help, what we just learnt, we go hotspot two because it's in the 2D script. We want our X and our Y coordinates, which will be zero and zero. Now we use our unique ID. So we'll go unID. However, we haven't incremented it from our last use. So at the moment, it's not unique. So I'll put a little line of code in front called unID equals unID plus one. We use a colon as an inline carriage return. So I've got my unique ID in place. What I need now is my parameter reference. Which parameter am I going to change with this hotspot? And it's corner R. So we'll just copy that in place. Now our flags. We want this one to be our base hotspot. So flags, hotspots type, plus hotspots attribute. So the type will be length type editing. That's what we're going for. And it's a base hotspot. And it's attribute. In this case, we will want to hide this hotspot. So that's J8. J8 is 128. 
So what that looks like is one plus one, two, eight. And that's our declaration for our base hotspot. And I'll just put a little comment so that I know which one it is. So what we need next is our moving hotspot. So let's copy this down as much as we know. Unid corner R, comma. So we've already figured out what this stuff is. What's our moving hotspot? Our moving hotspot is length type editing moving hotspot. So number two, that will be our moving hotspot. And our third hotspot will be our reference hotspot. So once again, copying down, indenting, and changing this to three. And if we look at our help, we'll see that type is three, length type editing, reference hotspot. And this is always hidden. So we'll put in here, reference. Now I haven't filled out the coordinates yet. This can be a bit to get your head around, and this is how I do it. I have all my coordinates at zero, and then I figure out where I want them to go. So our hotspot will be down here. Our moving hotspot, well, let's work on the chamfered one. It's a little bit easier to visualize. So this is our base hotspot at zero, zero. This is our moving hotspot, which will be corner R in the X, but zero in the Y. So our moving hotspot will be corner R in the X and zero in the Y. Our reference hotspot needs to be from the moving hotspot through the base hotspot in the opposite direction. And to keep it simple, we just use one. So in this case, it will be minus one in the X axis. Let's just tidy this up so it's easy to read. Here's the thing with dynamic hotspots, you can't test them in the 2D view. So if I was to open this 2D view, I can see my hotspot sitting there, but I can't click on it and edit it. I have to save my object and test it in the plan environment. So here's my hotspot. What happens if I click on it and try it? I've got my feedback there saying corner radius. I can drag it. I can't go any further than zero because we've limited it. And I can't go any further than 85 because we've limited it. So there we go. We've got our dynamic hotspot and I can type in a value 35. And it's changed all those corners. Let's have a look at this one here. I can change my radius has the same functionality. So that's good. Let's try this one. Hang on a minute. We don't want it there on our square one, do we? What's the point of having that? We only want it to show if the desktop is rounded or chamfered. So this is where using a go subroutine comes in handy. So we'll go back to our 2D script. Under hotspots, we will say if our desktop type equals D type rounded. Or our desktop type equals D type chamfered. Go sub hotspots. Let's save it, have a look. So our hotspot is there. And it's working. Our hotspot is there. And it's working, and our hotspot is not here. So good. Now here's another thing. It's only on one corner. Now that may be fine, but you may have objects where you want this to appear on every corner. So let's have another look at our loops to see if we can get those to work in our favor here. Just before I do, under this conditional statement, I've used the connector OR. So it will test both conditions, and if either one is true, it does my subroutine. Another way to write that instead of the word or, if we go to our help, if you go to expressions and functions, operators, 
Boolean operators. Here we go. We've got and, or, or logical exclusive or. So I've used or. The alternative to using the whole word of or is to use this pipe symbol. And that's found typically above your enter key, your return key on your keyboard. So if I just show you that, desk type, D type rounded, I can go or. So that symbol means the same as or. Now, why would I use that? Because it makes your code tighter. It's a personal preference. Sometimes it's good to help compact your code to keep your conditional statements nice and pithy. It can also make you look like a cool coder, like you really know what you're doing. So where are we going to execute this loop? So remembering we're on one corner, we want to jump to all four corners. That's going to happen when hotspots are executed. So we'll put our loop down in the subroutine itself, not at the top where the subroutine's called, but down in the subroutine itself. So how are we going to do this? So we'll think about how we want our hotspot to work. At the moment, it's stretching along the X axis. When it's on the far side of the desk, we still want it stretching along the X axis. And when it's on the opposite side of the desk, we want it to be coming back, still stretching along the X axis, but towards the origin, not away. So we'll do our Y execution first. So we'll go for I equals one, two, two. I'll just in, indent that because this series of hotspot statements now belongs to my for loop. Next I, making sure that I'm using the right incremental value here, I. So for I equals one to two, we want to execute it on the zero, zero point first. Then we want to add B and execute it again. So let's go add two. We want to add nothing in the X and in the Y we want to add B. That'll loop around, execute it again. So then we want to finish that loop. So let's go del two because I've executed a transformation in a two iteration. I'll have two st outstanding transformations, so del two. Let's just have a look at that to start with. There we go. There's my first hotspot. There's my second hotspot. And they both do the same function. How can I get away with doing that when it's the same hotspot command and each hotspot statement needs its unique ID? Well, if we have a look at our script, every time this line of code runs, it's incrementing that unique ID value. So every time it runs, it adds one, adds one, adds one. So it's always unique. So it's actually a separate hotspot, even though it's the same statement. So we've done our one side of the desk. We want to go to the other side of the desk and flip it around and come back the other way. So let's add a nested loop here. We'll go for J, not I, otherwise we'll get into an infinite loop equals one to two. We only want the front and the back of the desk at this end. Indent it so I know where it belongs. Finish my loop statement next J, making sure I'm using the right indexer. And what do we want to do? Once we've done one side and we've finished that loop, which is here, and we've deleted back to our zero, zero point, now we want to add the length of our desk, which is A. We don't want to add anything in the Y. And we want to scale by negative one, which is effectively mirroring our command. So then we go mul two. And in the X direction, it's a minus one scale. And in the Y direction, we want it to stay as is, which is a one. Then it will loop around and do the same two commands. So what we've done is we've gone hotspot, Hotspot, then we're adding, mirroring, hotspot, hotspot. We've finished our loop. Once again, we need to delete our stack. So we've got one, two statements here. We've got two loops. So two by two is four. Del four. Let's check our script. 
I've got a warning. Hang on, have I got the wrong number of deletions? Did I miscalculate here? Now, this is an interesting trap to fall into because the error is not here. If I read this carefully, cannot delete transformation above the top. So essentially, this means I can't delete more transformations than I have actually done. And it's at line 64. If I click stop, sometimes it'll take you there, sometimes it won't. But if I go control L or go to line and I go to line 64 to double check, what I find out here is I've actually got too many transformations here. So what I didn't do when I translated my 3D script to 2D script is I forgot to delete this transformation, which was the corresponding transformation for my 3D add Z for the desktop, which I didn't need because it's only 2D. So let's have another look. Check. Good. Script is OK. Let's save it. Have a look. There we go. There are my four dynamic hotspots which adjust the corner radius or corner chamfer of my desk. Here's another little trick about the dynamic hotspots. On this desk, it's a corner radius, right? That makes sense. It's rounded, radius, all good. This one, we don't want it to read corner radius. We want it to read corner chamfer, right? Corner radius doesn't make sense when it's a chamfer. This is where our display parameter and custom description come into play. So we've got here our display parameter and our custom description. We have a look at what they do. We've got display parameter. Parameter to display in the information palette when editing the parameter reference parameter. And custom description is custom description string for the displayed parameter. All right, what does that mean? Let's have a look. 2D script, this is executed on the moving hotspot. So we'll put our display parameter here, which in this case is the same as our parameter reference. And just to show you what happens, I'll just use a silly little string called boot. It's OK, let's save it and have a look. So if I now edit this hotspot, my feedback says boo. Right, so how are we going to do it so that when it's a rounded corner, we have corner radius, and when it's a chamfered corner, we have chamfer size. In our 2D script, under here, we'll create a variable, and we'll call it corner description equals corner radius. Then we'll say if desktop type equals D type chamfered, then corner description equals chamfer size. And down here, we replace this with corner description. Let's check our script. Looks good. We'll save it and have a look at the result. So on our rounded desk, it says corner radius when we edit that corner. And on our chamfered desk, it now says chamfer size. So there you go. That's the basics and a couple of advanced tips on link type dynamic hotspots. I'll just tidy it up a little bit. Put these at the same tab spacing so it's easy to read. Well, that wraps up this video. I hope you learned something and I hope you give it a go yourself. In the next video, I'm going to talk about hot lines and hot arcs. What are they? Well, I'll tell you all about it and how they're useful to you in the next video. So see you then.